Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. We say both because Full Stature Ministries is for the people around the world that knew us as Full Stature way before there was a church. And we're still Full Stature, still the vision, the vision and the mission. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, Jason's going to be sharing this morning, but before we begin... Uh, uh, Christy had a word, and I want Christy to come on up and share this word in our prayer time. Yeah, this was uh, this was real brief, but when worship started, <clears throat> I kept hearing that in His presence is fullness of joy, in His presence is healing, and as we entered in, there's going to be healing, not just sporadic healing for this congregation, but the whole the whole congregation that will be a witness and a testimony and then also I saw and I don't know all the details about angels and, and but I saw angels dancing up and down they're like healing angels and they weren't just touching people but they were looking at us like why aren't you dancing with us this is there's healing here there's um, it, it was like a low grade fog I mean I couldn't see their feet but they were just dancing in amongst and looking at us like why aren't y'all doing what we do? We worship, and we and in that in His presence is fullness of healing. Anyway, I was encouraged. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And actually, you know, the angels hearken unto the voice of God. We need to come into agreement with whatever they're sent to do and accomplish. So, Father, right now we release gifts of healing, the anointing of healings. We receive healing, physical and, and uh, mental and emotional. And so, Father, we just thank you that you who began that good work are going to continue that work until the day of Christ Jesus. We're still continuing in the 60-day uh, peace challenge. We've got the month of August yet. Uh, I hope you're doing wonderful maintaining your peace. When you lose it, get back there fast, super fast. And uh, it trains your spirit to respond more to God. And, and, and operate out of the inside. Uh, I'm looking forward to today's message. We're gonna, Jason's going to be sharing, and we're going to uh, minister at, at, uh, at the end of the service. But also, uh, I wanted it on camera because uh, I haven't gotten on Facebook yet. But on Tuesdays, from 6 to 7, our normal service is 7 to 8. That'll be the soaking and uh, body sharing together, that will be made the same. But six to seven is going to be some teaching and uh, uh, ministry. So encourage. Like we used to do on Thursdays. Like we used to do on Thursdays, yeah. Just ministering to people. People learn a lot by doing more than by just listening. So it'll be a combination of uh, a lot of, oh, we use the word activation, but all that means is to incite and release to Stir up is really what it means in the Bible. Stir up the stuff that's in there for it. In Jesus' name, amen. It'll be, the total will be six to eight, but six to seven is just ministry and teaching. Then it's body ministry where everybody shares from seven to eight. That will remain as always the same. So encourage anybody if they, if they want ministry or they want to observe, six o'clock on Tuesdays from now on. We'll, we'll get Eventually we'll get it on Facebook because right now Facebook only says 7 o'clock. Um, so, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hope everybody had a, had a great week. <clears throat> And uh, everybody's doing really good on the peace challenge, I assume. I haven't heard any. I don't haven't heard any uh, issues, right? I failed. 
I, I, I'm not a failure. But I, but I, but yeah, the, the first month was maybe five days I, I had peace. <laughs> but we know how to get back into peace, right? So it's, that's why it's a challenge. Well, today uh, I have the, the opportunity to, to share on something that the Lord put his finger on earlier. Um, part of, part of my problem with the with the peace challenge was I w- one week that my my wife was was gone, my kids were gone, and I wanted to deal with some internal things while I had peace in the house, while well, quiet, right? And and the Lord put His finger on something, and I, and I and I could I didn't know how to deal with it, and I and I felt like I was stuck, and so you know. After you know, pride and everything took a took a fall. I had to call Dad and Jennifer to help me pray through things and see where you know to see if I could find the root of what was going on. I was really depressed that they were gone. I was really sad, but um, what it came down to was there was I was I, I was lied to when I was young. I was lied to, and I and I and I know that you guys are going to know. You're going to have something that that will ring true to you as well, um, because we we all pretty much were lied to in certain areas of our lives, and what we do with that lie and that misconception or whatever it was, um, control uh, from outside of us um, is what's really important. the 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 topic for today is pleasure, and I purposely use the word pleasure because it's one of those things that isn't really talked about in church. We can talk about joy and enjoyment and how our joy is made full. We can talk about happiness, but pleasure always has this weird, like dirty connotation to it, right, sometimes. But that was because it was twisted. When I was growing up, this is the lie. When I was growing up, my grandmother, of course, my grandmother's parents and her grandparents and everybody from, from Italy, they were told that in order to maintain in life, how to, in order to get by in life, that you aren't, don't let yourself get too happy. Don't let yourself enjoy too much. Don't let yourself be overjoyed in anything that you do, um, participate in. You know, if it's a party, you know, just sit in the back and, you know, enjoy your friends that are there or whatever. But don't get too involved because eventually, you, you know, the, the, the floor is going to drop out. You're going to... You know, you're going to get let down. Um, and and the, the whole, I was taught that by my grandmother, that don't get too excited because eventually you get let down. Don't, uh. but what I learned was the, the fact that, you know, when I'm, I was, um, Gwen and I developed a, a card set for, for, for kids, you know, between five and 11 that we're working on. And what, what triggered this in me was that um, a publisher friend of ours that, that that works with a publisher wanted to take it from me and say, "Hey, we're going to do this for you because we love you. We know that you know this is good stuff." And I immediately was like, "Okay." Where it, most people, I mean, honestly, would be like, "Wow, that's awesome! Thank you so much!" And I was like, I didn't let myself. And enjoy that moment even because um, I don't know what that looks like what's it, what's gonna happen how much is involved what you know all that stuff I just beat myself down with the, the you know the can't be too excited can't be too happy and I and it triggered something in me and it and I I realized that I was like wow that's not God that's not it doesn't feel right was that me was that was that it's not definitely not God. Was it just an outside source? Was it demonic? Whatever it was, was not God. And I said, I need to find the source of that root because I could see where that, can you see where that would have affected a lot of different things in my life later? You know, don't get out of the shallow end because somebody's going to drain the pool on you someday. <laughs> so you never enjoy swimming. You could be there, you know, you can be present. But you're not in the fullness. 
you can't have that fullness of joy that the, that the Bible speaks about. So I, what I what I, I said I was thinking through these things that ail us sometimes, just like that was like, ouch, that's definitely not God, right? It could erase some of those fears, some of those lies, and bring to light some of those things that we've been taught, that that we just took for granted as subtle. They're not a big deal, so I don't really need to pay attention to them. But then you look back later in life and you're like, wow, I could have enjoyed so many things that I didn't allow myself to. Not only did I, not only did I do it out of fear, which is fear motivated, which is control, which is what the spirit of control is, is witchcraft. Right? All those things I could have enjoyed. And that God made for us to enjoy. Anyway, the truth is, is that we've been told a lot of lies in our lifetime. They haunt us. They keep us frustrated. They make us value the wrong things. They resent and resent the wrong things. They were widespread. And we accepted them without even thinking. We organized our life accordingly. So many things that I could have enjoyed. Now, this is all about me, but I'm going to show you that this is about you as well. Remember when we were told that margarine was, was better for you than butter? How, how many? I mean, this is, I'm, I'm dating myself, right? But I can't believe it's not butter. And we had that Fabio guy with the long hair. He used to, he used to be painted for like the, the portraits on, on like uh, women's fantasy books and stuff. Well, he was Fabio, and he was the, the, the star of the I Can't Believe It's Not Butter commercials, trying to produce that stuff. Well, we found out now, of course, that it's worse for you, your body, and everything than, than butter is. But, um, and that's just a fact. We've been lied to. We believed it. We went through with it. We bought it. You know, my mom shoved it down my throat, especially during that time where all fat is bad. You have to be on a fat-free diet or you're in a, you know, you, you might just croak. Oh, um, and we did it for decades. Uh, you know, what, what I've believed for so long, I find out that, you know, what, what felt right was, was re really just like what I learned and processed, and it was opinion. It wasn't really reality. <laughs> some of those lies were nonsense, you know, um, but some of them had purpose, you know, like if you shave too early you know, as a, as a young kid, that your hair will grow back thicker and darker. Um, it's not true. I, I just have to throw that out there. It's not true. It was that that lie was was formed on the basis of you know we don't want your 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 young girls and, and daughters shaving their legs too early, so we scared them. You know, the same as like coffee stunts your growth. Coffee does not stunt your growth. Caffeine or uncaffeinated, uncaf decaffeinated, it does not stunt your growth. But those things are what we tell in order to have control. We manipulate, we, or we've been manipulated by those phrases, right? They're subtle. They're like the little foxes. Like I, we, we talked a little bit about little foxes, how they spoil the, they spoil the vine. They're, and um, uh, that was quite a while ago that we had, uh, I was up here with Gwen and I was talking about that. Um, but they're subtle, a subtle lies with subtle fear that isn't overwhelming but there's just a little bit of fear in it enough to make you stop and think, whoa, I don't need to do that. Or, um, whoa, I got to wait an hour before I get in the pool and swim. You know, it's not true. I mean, people still think that, but honestly, it's really not true. Um, there, there might be a sense of truth in those lies, you know, overall, but they're not. Um, but what about it? But what about those lies that we believe about ourselves? Just like the one that I w was talking about it, um, with my grandmother, you can't be too happy. That messed me up for a really long time. Until actually just the other day, in fact. That's many, many years. I could have been happy about a lot of different things. <laughs> but instead, I, if I was happy and I did enjoy certain things, that I felt guilty and ashamed. And then I'm like, I'm praying, I, I pray about it. And I was like, wow, you know, I should have been really excited about this and that. And I wasn't. And why? Why did I beat myself down like that? It's just senseless. 
mine and mine and was a fear guard right it's what it's that 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 tiny bit of fear that says i will keep you safe in the shallow end in case somebody drains the water out of the pool you'll still have a foot you know a foothold right that's that's what a fear guard is and so we you know you pray against fear as it guards instead of having peace guard you right um can't be too happy, I'll get blindsided. One of the things that we want to, we, we try to teach our children um, at, a, at an early age, and some of the things that we need to know now, even as adults, is states versus traits. It's when we are told a lie, we believe it, and then it becomes a part of us. It's like a false personality, right? There's a, there's a state versus a trait. What does, what does that mean? States refer to temporary conditions, temporary emotions, anger, fear, you know, ecstasy, whatever the emotion is, but it's temporary. But when you hang on to it and it becomes a trait is when it becomes an ungodly thing, right? Unless it's, unless it's a, by the Holy Spirit or fruit of the Spirit, becoming a part of us, which is what we want. It's something that should have gone away, like a state. It's the difference between I feel and I am, right? For kids, it's, uh, I, you, we have to make sure that they're, they're you know, I, I feel angry. And I can, and ex, you know, and then we can pray them through the different, you know, ways of, of getting rid of that emotion. Instead of I am an angry person. I am angry all the time, right? It's subtle, but you, but, but there's a different, there's a, there's a, there's like a, there needs to be a, a good boundary between the two so that they don't fall into their, a false personality. You say, I am afraid, but I'm not fearful. I'm not a fearful person, right? I, I, I have fear right now, but I know that God can take it away. And, and then I can be set free, and I can be peaceful. Um, totally different things. And we have, like I said, we, we teach the children from, you know, the best that we can on those two things to make sure that they don't suck anything in like I did when I was young. Um, from a biblical perspective, the differentiation between I feel which is a state, or versus I am, a trait, aligns with the teachings of Scripture about our identity in Christ. Natural emotions are acknowledged in Scripture as carnal or temporary, while our identity in Christ is eternal and unchanging in expressing the God emotions. They're eternal and unchanging. The fruit of the Spirit is eternal and unchanging. While our identity in Christ is eternal and unchanging in expressing God's emotions, which are the fruit of the Spirit? We can navigate our emotions, ups and downs, with hope and assurance rooted in the secure, enduring traits of our God and His identity in us. This perspective only fosters personal spiritual growth, but it also empowers us to live our faith with godly confidence and compassion. God desires for us to enjoy Him and His creation. One of the things like I was lied to about was I wasn't really allowed to have any fun. I wasn't allowed to have good things. I, like I could draw a picture. One of the first things that I learned is that in, in art, and I was really good throughout my high school years. I won awards and all kinds of things. Um, but I beat myself down so much because I was criticized by my teachers all throughout. Even though I excelled Compared to my classmates, my teachers were like, B, C, you could do better. But, I, but it was like night and day compared to what I was producing. It was like their idea was trying to push me into because they knew that I was talented. They would push me into. And, but, but I didn't understand that at the time. I just felt like I was being, ouch. I mean, that was painful. That was, my, that was who I was that I was expressing. Um, in the artwork, and so I numbed that down to make it like it's not worth anything. Their judgment isn't worth anything. But on you know on the, the flip side of that coin is that praise then is not worth anything. 
you know, when you're honored for anything, it's like worth nothing, as well as criticized. It doesn't make me feel any different. I could win awards and I was like, mm, cool. I didn't care. It wasn't that fantastic. Either way, I wasn't hurt, but I never enjoyed anything, right? It, it, that's, it, it, got, it got me. I let it in. In the context of enjoying God and his creation, the opposite of pure pleasure can be termed as corrupt pleasure. And this is a form of pleasure that is sought outside of God's boundaries, leading to spiritual and emotional and even physical harm. Corrupt pleasure involves indulging in activities or desires that, while momentarily gratifying, ultimately separate us from God and his intended purpose for our lives. It includes behaviors and attitudes that distort God's gifts and misuse them for selfish ends. So there's a pure pleasure that God created, God designed within his boundaries, and there's a corrupt pleasure, obvious. Most of our, our minds, when we say pleasure, go to the corrupt side because of all of the prevailing things that we've seen in our lives growing up, right? The things that we've been media has pushed down our throats and, and whatnot. Some characteristics, there's four characteristics of corrupt pleasure that would give you a hint, right? It's self-centered. Corrupt pleasure often revolves around self, self-gratification, without regard for God's will or the well-being of others. We're in it for God and love. Love God and love others. It's like one of the best things you could do <laughs> according to scripture, right? Philippians 3.19 and, and, and the Philippians booklet, um, I highly recommend because of the speaking of enjoying and joy in God. It's pretty much all of Philippians, right? And we'll get into that later. But Philippians 3.19 says their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. <coughs> Self-centered. Two, they, there's either an excess or lack of self-control. Honestly, this is what I struggle with because if there's a box of open chocolate chip cookies on my counter, I'm going to eat them. They were in my face. I, I, I pray for the... You know, and, and, and self-control um, is, is a fruit, it's really, it's a, it's a fruit of the Spirit. And it is something that we can, you know, we can pray for and, and have that adjusted in our lives. Now, I'm working on that. I'm a, I'm a work in progress, especially with chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> I'm a cookie monster. This, the lack of self-control is a form of pleasure, and it, it, it frequently involves excess or lack of moderation. Proverbs 25, 16 says, if you find honey and eat just enough, that's great, but too much of it and you're gonna puke. That's basically what it says, Proverbs 25, 16. <laughs> it's great, find it, eat it in moderation. It's sweet, it's good for your soul, but too much and you will get sick. Temporary fulfillment is another characteristic of corrupt pleasure. Corrupt pleasure offers only fleeting satisfaction and often leaves a person feeling empty and disillusioned. The fourth thing that corrupt pleasure does, guilt and shame like no other, right? Unlike pure pleasure, corrupt pleasure often leads to feelings of guilt and shame. Romans 6.21 says, what benefit did you reap at the time from your things you are now ashamed of. Those things result in death. How to avoid corrupt pleasure? One, ground yourself in the Word. Regularly, you're reading and praying and meditating on His Word. You're, you're learning patterns and principles about God. Two, cultivate a relationship with Him. I can't emphasize that enough. You got to know not just his patterns and principles that are written for you, but you need to know him in his nature 
And the only way you can do that is spend time with him in relationship. You can't do it any other way. Practice self-control. That's number three. And moderation. Exercise self-control and moderation in all aspects. Galatians 5.22 says, highlights self-control as a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Four, seek accountability. Everybody knows, well, everybody should know this. Surround yourself with a community of believers that are, are, are doing well, that you can bounce things off of, that you can open your heart, not be embarrassed, share with, what's, you know, with them what's going on, and be healed. We need each other. That's how we were created. Spur one another toward love and any good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And that's in Hebrews 10. Focus on eternal joy. Keep an eternal perspective. An eternal, recognizing the true and lasting joy comes from God and our future with Him. And Colossians 3 2 says, Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things, which is exactly the opposite of corrupted pleasure. Confession and repentance. Everybody knows. When you stray, you confess your sin, you turn back. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's how we get back to abiding. Receive forgiveness. Move on. Easy peasy. <laughs> all of that, though, all six of those points, you can sum up into basically to develop a relationship with the Lord and develop a good, healthy fear of the Lord. All of those other things will kind of happen because of those things. Develop relationship and fear of the Lord. Pure pleasure rooted in relationship with God and proper enjoyment of His creation stands a stark contrast between the two. So what is it? What is pure pleasure? Pleasure was actually part of God's original design for us. Did you know that? C.S. Lewis understood this. He wrote in his classic work, The Screwtape Letters. I don't know if any of you are familiar. Um, it's pretty wild. Screwtape was, a, was a, a demon. And, well, anyway, let me, let me read this little part here. The Screwtape Letters, Screwtape confesses his, to his protege demon, never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure on its healthy, normal, and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on enemy's ground. The enemy is capitalized as because it's God, right? I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. Screwtape builds on this comment later in his correspondence with the, with his, uh, as a master demon. He admits this of God. He says, God, of God, he says, He's a hedonist at heart. All those fasts and vigils and stakes and crosses are only a facade. Or only like a foam on the seashore, out at sea. Out in his sea, there is pleasure, and ever more pleasure. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. He has filled his world full of pleasures. There are things for humans to do all day long and without his minding in the least. Sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, playing, praying, working. Everything, everything has to be twisted before it's any use to us. Doesn't that give you some insight? I love the way he put it. The joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10 do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Not only is it a feeling, it's a, it's a strengthening in us, right? It gives us strength. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. We talked about this this morning. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. We don't really see all of that all the time when we're reading the scriptures about God and his nature and things. His right hand are pleasures evermore. 
we feel guilty when we enjoy things sometimes, even when they're not bad, that God actually wanted us to enjoy them. We, we after, over you know, the teachings in the church over the years, we feel as Christians, we are not allowed to enjoy anything. The Christian walk is, is, a, is a do this, don't do that. And in, and, in, and in all reality, it's do this and enjoy your life within the bounds of what God has created. Enjoy, dance, be free. As long as there's a railing around your deck, you can enjoy being outside and doing whatever you want around it. Even studies in positive psychology show that having a strong sense of purpose and community significantly increases one's overall happiness. Get together with people that enjoy communion with them. Tuesday nights, Tuesday nights to me are people coming together, enjoying God together. And now we have teaching at six to seven, teaching and ministry, hands-on, which is priceless. Honestly, be here. And then we have get to know God and his presence for that last hour, really is what it is, what he's speaking to us as a church. Delight in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What does that mean? Delighting in God is both a command and a promise. It signifies a deep abiding pleasure in God's character and presence, which aligns our desires with his and then brings real fulfillment, true fulfillment. God created pleasure, and he created us with the ability to enjoy it. He gave us taste buds so that we could taste that steak, unless you're a vegetarian. (laughs) But then why did God make steak (laughs) taste so good, right? He gave us taste buds so that we can enjoy it. And those are the only, that's like, there's some things that he's created for our pleasure and our enjoyment that is strictly only for our pleasure and enjoyment because he likes to see us having fun and enjoying each other and and being in his presence and giving him the glory. He enjoys it. How many times, I mean, Christmas for me isn't about getting stuff for me. Gwen and I aren't real gift people as far as like love language, but but watching the kids' faces as they open up their things, it's like God does this with us. All those gifts and things that he's given us that he wants us to use and our abilities and our, you know, those things, he enjoys watching them, us open up and growing in them and, and producing more, right? He enjoys it. Just, I don't know, Zephaniah 317, he, he delights in me. He, he, he dances over me. He sings over me. What? That's so cool. But he wants, us to, he wants us to be able to have just as much enjoyment in life that he gave us. Our problem is what? That we, it's not that we seek pleasure, but it's that, that we, we seek it apart from him. When we delight in him, we find joy that surpasses all other pleasures. Delight in God aligns our desires with his. Pleasure in God leads to fulfillment. It's like the difference between oxytocin and dopamine. Dopamine will never, is never satisfies. The dopamine is the chemical in the brain that says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to jump out of this plane. Yeah, yeah. And when you hit the ground, you're done. You need to go find something else. And not only that, it has to be better and bigger and bolder in order to bring that excitement back. That's dopamine. The oxytocin brings fulfillment and joy that doesn't go away. Anyway, I'm sure we've taught on those two before. But it's like the difference between giving thanks and enjoying a delicious meal versus eating an entire box of donuts by yourself. You can do both, but the, the, a delicious meal with, a, with, a, with some great company and friends, um, there's nothing like that satisfaction, that fulfilling fulfillment that you have a good, a good meal, good, you know, good talk around the table, but then going to sit in the corner. We, our pleasures, one of the corrupt pleasures things is we want to do things in secret. 
when I was when 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 Emmy was a couple years younger, she's only four. She was two. She had this fetish with uh, butter, and so she would take sticks of butter, like wherever she found them in the fridge or on the on the counter, and she would hide in the corner and eat the whole thing. <laughs> Isn't that gross? <laughs> but she would hide in the corner because she knew it wasn't right. It was a <laughs> it was a pleasure that she wasn't supposed to be, you know, happy about. Well, anyway, but it's similar. We hide when we think we we are we are self serving. The person, what the scripture says, uh, he who separates himself seeks his own desires. He who separates himself seeks his own. So we can have the joy of the Lord. We can delight in the Lord just as he delights in us. There's an enjoyment in his creation as well. God's creation is another avenue which he invites us to experience joy. The natural world in its beauty and the complexity, how it actually radiates God's glory. It points to him in every way. Psalm 19 verse 1 and 2 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day we pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. Observing nature becomes an act of worship as we recognize and reveal the creativity and majesty of God in it. I used to go to the park. I used to go to the park just to look at trees and draw trees. And I felt God's presence so much during that time. Uh, it's just being in nature. One of the ways that we can express worship to God is by enjoying His creation. When, when we marvel at a sunset or take pleasure in a meal or simply enjoy the company of loved ones, we are honoring God as the giver of all good things. Did you know that even spending in time in nature can reduce stress and improve mood? Even secular opinion says that. God designed creation not just for utility, but he designed it for our pleasure and well-being. So taking a walk in the park might just be like a spiritual discipline. <laughs> I, know that, I know that these two have. They used to enjoy that all the time. And it's true. You can, you can feel God's presence. It's wonderful if you pay attention. Jesus said in John 15, 11, he says to his disciples, I have disciples, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus desires for us to experience his joy, a complete and perfect joy that comes from abiding in him. Paul in his letters, of course, we're going to go back into the Philippians, often encourages believers to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, Right? I will say it again, rejoice. This call to constant rejoicing underscores a perpetual, the perpetual nature of Christian joy that can be. It's perpetual. Just like our, his peace, any of the fruit of the Spirit is perpetual and enduring and everlasting forever. Joy can be ours as well. It's not dependent on circumstance, just like our peace that he gives us, but on our relationship with Christ. Jesus desires us to have complete joy, that our joy be complete in us, his joy, complete in us. Christian joy is perpetual and independent of circumstance. Of course, rejoicing, and you look at that, rejoicing always, and of course, you know, when he was writing a lot of, a, a lot of the, 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 the letters to the church, he was imprisoned, sometimes standing in knee-deep in muck from the sewers. And he's writing about rejoicing and being joyful in the Lord and that his joy is full when... These things happen when I hear, you know, that you're doing well and, and all these things bring joy and happiness to him. And, and he's like in the worst circumstances that people could be in. Like, that's incredible. It's just the, the way that joy works that we, if we allow it, right? But rejoicing always, it sounds like it's a tall order. I mean, it's hard, especially for a, a melancholy C temperament like myself to even think, wow, I could be happy and joyful all the time. It's like being told to eat seaweed chips <laughs> and enjoy them. <laughs> I had seaweed chips one time, and it was like, ah! It tastes like salty fish, flat. I know, yeah, it was gross. But, but, but really, it's possible. And, and the thing is, is 
his joy is more satisfying than any type of comfort food that we could have. It, it really is. Um, it's definitely more satisfying than seaweed chips. Um, but everything is. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is also listed in the, as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22, of course. Um, the supernat- this supernatural joy can emanate from us if we allow it. And when we walk in the Spirit, our lives will naturally, naturally produce it if we walk in the Spirit. So as we as we come like on Tuesday nights and we're soaking and we're we're we're, we're getting more involved in the, in in the, the depths of the spirit and and what he's speaking to us and things it's not just the peace that we're experiencing but we are allowed this is the biggest thing this is the biggest aha that I'm allowed to be joyful you're allowed to be joyful in his presence you're allowed to dance and sing and do whatever you want we we give you permission right if you if you feel the Lord move on you to do it, a dance, a hymn, a, a spiritual song, or whatever it is, do it. God loves to see that kind of thing happen. It's not that we we don't care, we don't judge, we don't do any of that silly stuff. We want the joy to be expressed. Supernatural joy can emanate from us. Let's do it. Recognizing that every good and perfect gift comes from God, as in James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights in heaven, who does not change like shifting shadows. Our enjoyment of life's pleasures should be a doorway to gratitude and worship. When we acknowledge these gifts as coming from God, these good things, our pleasure can be sanctified and deepened. It becomes pure pleasure. God's design, it always has purpose, right? And his design for pleasure has purpose as well. It serves us not only to bless us, but it also helps us to draw closer to him and to reflect his nature. Ecclesiastes 3.12 says, I know that there is nothing better for people to do than to be happy and do good while they live, (laughs) that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift from God. This is the gift of God, that we be happy and enjoy enjoy our lives. Even when it's hard work, we're, we're allowed to enjoy it, and we can. It highlights, this highlights the intrinsic goodness in finding satisfaction in daily life, portraying it as a divine gift. True pleasure is always rooted in purpose, and when we find joy in our work, and in our relationships, and in our worship, we are participating in the life that God intended for us originally. Pleasure without purpose is empty, but when aligned with God's design, it is fulfilling and meaningful. The only way you can make pleasure fulfilling and meaningful is when it's aligned with God's design. Which God's design has balance and boundaries, moderation. While God wants us to enjoy his creation, he also provides boundaries to ensure that our enjoyment leads to life and not destruction. Proverbs 25, 16 warns that if you find honey, just eat enough, like I said before, or you're going to get sick, don't do it. Pleasure becomes dangerous when it's sought outside of God's boundaries. It becomes dangerous. When we ignore his guidelines, right? What's meant to bring joy can bring harm. God's commands are not restrictive. They're not supposed to be restrictive. They are protective. Ensuring that our pleasures remain pure and life-giving. In community, I shared this with, with Dad a little bit, on Psalm 133, and it's one of the songs that the, that um, Jesus, the guy who plays Jesus on The Chosen, sings in one of the episodes, I think in season one. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down the beard, and on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion, for the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This psalm celebrates the blessings and beauty of unity in God's people. It often is associated with gathering the Israelites during that, their pilgrimage to, to um, Jerusalem. 
uh, I believe it's one of the, you know one of the uh, Psalms of Ascent. Um, but it's while they were they emphasize the joy and the harmony of being together in worship. Which again, it's like our Tuesday nights. What we're doing. The unity is not just a superficial agreement, but a deep, heartfelt connection that brings joy and satisfaction. This verse reminds us that unity is a treasure and a source of great blessing, and it enhances our lives together. God also intends for us to enjoy life in the context of community. The Bible is filled with instances of communal celebration feasts, like in Acts chapter 2. It describes in, in uh, verse 46 and 7, describes the early church. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. This joy, this type of joy, is a testament to the fellowship and unity found in the body of Christ. So we need community and celebration with each other. Shared joy is multiplied. When we celebrate together, we are not we only not only deepen our relationships, but we also magnify our appreciation of God's blessing. Community celebrations are a foretaste of the eternal joy that we will experience in God's presence someday. There's suffering and joy. Interestingly, the Bible says, speaks of finding joy amidst suffering in, in uh, James 1. It says, consider it pure joy when, whenever you face trials of any kind, when you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and it goes on and on. It sounds paradoxical, but one of the things that I, I was so excited about when God put his finger on this particular subject for me, this, what this is all came up, this whole teaching came from one, that, that one little lie that you're not, you shouldn't be too happy. You, you shouldn't too, get too excited about that. I was so excited when I heard that. I was so excited. I was, I was, that is the type of joy that's odd, but in God, it's like, wow, that's a big thing and it's gonna affect lots of areas and I'm gonna deal with this and it's gonna be awesome because am I weird? I wanna deal with stuff so that I could feel better, I could be better, I could uh, treat my kids better, I can give them a, a better legacy, I could treat my wife better. It makes sense, right? I was so excited when there's hard things come up. Suffering, it was painful, but so worth it. I, I'm, and I don't even know, I'm, I'm just a tip of the iceberg in the revelation of joy. <laughs> <laughs> and re pleasure in God and, and all that stuff is like sounds so foreign, but I but I but I know that it's there's a, there's a reality of it because I can feel it, and it, it, it and it'll grow. And um, so anyway, that's exciting and, and and that's the kind of thing that I I love praying with people that are like never prayed with them before and they and they open up and we're like just first feel forgive. And they do it, and they're like, wow, I feel peace. After hearing that they've worked with other people for years and nothing has happened for them. I'm, uh, it's, it blows my mind, and I'm so excited about it. I'm happy when I hear those types of things that God is doing, but it's within his bounds. I don't have to go outside of his bounds to be completely fulfilled. That was so fulfilling to even hear that. It's the same as the fulfillment that I get when I work on hard things for myself internal things that are that are off that God puts his finger on. It's exciting because I don't know what it's going to be attached to. I don't know what good is going to come from it, you know. It's 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 awesome that wonder comes back as a child. God does not he doesn't waste our pain is what I'm saying. He doesn't and I know that all of it's usable. All of it's usable. Even in suffering, there's potential for deep, transformative joy. Even in pain, physical pain even, there's, there's an opportunity to experience a transformative joy in our lives. God is with us. It comes from knowing that. He is working through our trials and that there's a greater purpose beyond our current pain. 
The scriptures reveal, in conclusion, a God who deeply desires for us to enjoy him and his creation. Pure pleasure is rooted in purpose. It requires balance and moderation. It thrives in community, and it is transformative even amidst hardship or suffering. We do not need to fear pleasure. We need to fear alienation from God that corrupts <laughs> pure pleasure. The way that God originally designed for us within his framework. This enjoyment is not superficial or fleeting, but it's rooted in a profound relationship with him and a deep appreciation of his work. From the joy found in his presence, the delight in his character, and the pleasure in his creation, to the eternal joy that his promises people, God's invitation to joy and pleasure is comprehensive and transformative if we allow it. God's pleasure and our pleasure are not at odds. We find our greatest joy when we live in the fullness of what he's created us to be. As we delight in God and his creation, we reflect his glory and participate in the abundant life that he has promised. Pure pleasure is rooted in relationship with God and a proper enjoyment of his creation. And this stands in stark contrast to corrupt pleasure by grounding ourselves in the living word and cultivating relationship with him. We can embrace this type of joy and stay away from the destructive path of corrupt pleasure. <clears throat> Embracing God's design for our pleasure ensures a life of joy, purpose, spiritual health, and remember, even when the Bible says there's a time to laugh, Ecclesiastes 3, 4. So go ahead and smile and enjoy God's goodness this week. Now, like I said before, this whole teaching was the result of one tidy, subtle lie that God exposed in my prayer time. Um, and I was told this lie, and I told myself this lie my entire life, I'm going to give you some examples of things that you might have heard, subtle statements, subtle lies, um, and we want to we want to we want to help you pray through some of these things. Um, I'm sure that some of these will resonate with some of you. Let me give you some examples. If they really knew me, they wouldn't like me. If I don't volunteer, I won't be criticized for my performance. Just play it safe. Don't rock the boat. Don't get your hopes up. That was similar to mine. Stay in your lane. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. People will always disappoint me, so there's no so it's better not to trust anyone. I'm not good enough or I don't deserve love and, and respect. I must be perfect to be accepted. Happiness is fleeting and it, it just doesn't last. I'm responsible for other people's happiness. If I forgive, I'll be taken advantage of. If I offer to help, I'll be taken advantage of. Success is only for other people, not for me. My dreams are unrealistic and not worth pursuing. If I speak up, I'll cause conflict and be disliked. It's safer to stay in my comfort zone. I'm not important enough to make a difference. It's better to keep my emotions hidden than to avoid being judged. To avoid being judged, right? If I express my true thoughts or feelings, people will reject me. If I ask for help, I'll be seen as weak. I can't change. This is who I am. That's a bad one. We can fix that. But all of these things, if you've any of those things resonated in you or any lie has come up while we were talking, even that isn't on this page. Um, 
we want to we want to be able to do some ministry tonight, uh, this morning, and uh, and see if it's it really involves the last two steps on the on the blue card, which the blue card is what, first feel forgive, fact fill. We don't do a lot of fact fill, but when it comes to bitter root, things are from a long time ago, things that you believed, things that you said, oh, this is me, I'm not going to change. That's just the way I am. Hmm. Is that God? Is it the way that God created you? Is it, is it God's nature? If it's not, then it's not who you were. It's not who you really are. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dad, and we're going to have some ministry time this morning. If we, if we don't get any response from the audience, we'll just pray Jason through yeah. something else. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me call you out now. I'll be really happy, but I'll probably cry. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that we're in the month of the, uh, the peace challenge yet for August, but I know what God's working on. Jason and I are on the same track on the joy. There's, we're going to have a joy challenge. Because if you read the Amplified Bible, this is what today's about, the Amplified Bible... Everybody knows what an Amplified Bible is. Read the Beatitudes. Blessed, happy, with a life joy that is enviable are those who... Da, 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 da. A life joy that is enviable. It's what the people in the arena had when they were Christians were being fed to the lions. That's the challenge. That's not dead religion. Can you imagine people watching people sacrificing their life saying they have a makarios in the Greek. They have a life joy that is enviable. I think that's where the halos even came from, really. They didn't know how to express a, a glory countenance change from people. And it says, by the way, in the Amplified, it says, blessed, happy are those who receive a life joy that is enviable regardless of circumstances. That's the supernatural realm. That's the kingdom. That's the the realm of God, not not religion where you duty bound and try and trust and burn out and try harder and fail. God's looking for a life joy that is enviable. That's supernatural. Otherwise, whatever you're living is lacking what God has made available. Uh -huh. Anybody respond to that? You heard of, there's a voice you've heard most of your life like Jason. And you just said, that's me. That's, that's who I am. Any of those you indicate, any of that, I want you to come up right now. If there's anything. Okay. Come on, Lisa. And I'm going to walk it through so that the people watching by video can take the simple five steps where it's necessary. 30 out of every 30 or 40 emotional healings that you can do on your own is first feel forgive. You deal first person or situation, feel the feeling, and let that mingled spirit that's you and Jesus forgive until it changes to peace. And that's permanent. That peace is permanent. Most healings are first feel forgive. But what we're talking about now, like in Jason's case, was going for a bitter root a lie. So we're going to dismantle the lie. All right. And, and whatever in that list that Jason had, if you believe those things and you suck them in and you think that's true, that's you, that's not the Bible, that's you taking on a lie, then you need to know how to dismantle it. And we're going to teach you how to do that. But first, we're going to do it with Lisa. All right. All right. First person or situation. Say it out loud. Um. Well, what came to me is um, I was outside in my backyard and I grew up between two brothers, so I was super athletic with everybody. And I was joking around and I said, yeah, I'm instead of Willie Horton, I'm Wilma Horton. And I'm, you know, the best batter in town. And um, my brother said, Lisa, you're going to become so proud. You are so proud. And something I sucked in. I was like, okay. oh my gosh. And I'm going to be proud if I ever really try. Anything. If you really try or accomplish anything, you'll just be proud. Very good. Okay. All right. So 
How do we start? First feel forgive. You have to deal with the emotion behind it. Put your hand on your spirit, the door of the heart. You picture your brothers making that statement. First release forgiveness to them. Yeah, she did it. Receive forgiveness for having taken it in. You're never going to be able to renounce anything until you do this part. And you did that. Nod your head if you did it, right? Yeah. So now she received forgiveness for taking in a mental stronghold that's been there a long time. Maybe her whole Christian life, maybe her whole life. She's got peace now by receiving forgiveness. When the peace of God rules, Jesus is ruling. Now she has Christian authority. You don't have Christian authority until you have peace. Peace means he's ruling. He's the authority that you relinquish to. Now, renounce out loud the lie. Hmm. I just renounce the lie that if I try hard, I'm going to become proud. Uh, this is the... This is the fun part now. Oh. Now, Holy Spirit, what's the truth? Uh, this kind of see, he said, um, I've made you to succeed. The uh, shame and guilt have been trying to take you down, but I've made you, you to, to succeed. succeed. Very good. <laughs> so, Father, right now, this is the way we pray. Write that on the tablet of Lisa's heart as a permanent part of the divine nature that I made you to succeed. I made you to succeed. Thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Mm. How many saw the process? You see the process? If you're watching my video and you don't know what's going on, uh, I have discerned the human spirit. Uh, and I can tell when she's doing it, but that's not the point. She needs to know she's doing it. It has nothing to do with me in reality. It's just the way I learned that people say the right answers, but a lot of times there's nothing going on in their spirit. With their heart, is far from me, but their lips, they praise me. We don't want that. If I can say something, I, yep. I just see like all the pictures of where it's affected my life. But even I couldn't understand like I'd be in a race and I'd let myself be second. And I'd be in gymnastics. I was on a team and I'd always be second. And I was never, there was something that stopped me from just being first. Very good. So We used to call that kind of a flurry. A lot of times when you get a, a, a root issue of a lie and the lies removed, what do you have? Clarity. You see, mm -hmm. but you might see a whole flurry of, I can't believe I did mm -hmm. that. I did that mm -hmm. my whole life. That's the way Jason was. I, can't, I can think of scores and scores of situations where I did that. Mm -hmm. No more. <laughs> I was made by God to succeed in That's Jesus' right. name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So you pray for us because I think we're, we're, we're on a supernatural track of God. Six o'clock to 7 o'clock, we're going to be doing this kind of ministry and some teaching. But I'm telling you what, we're still doing the Peace Challenge for August, but Jason and I are on track. There's going to be a joy that's supernatural, that's called for in the Scripture. It's clear in the Scripture, but what people have done is they just get religious and they ignore that. If you can't do something, what do you do? You don't read that part, right? But the Kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And righteousness is actually love and action. The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. We should be emanating that so that people would say they have a life joy. A life, that life joy is supernatural. It's not about, well, Jason did quite a great job on making the distinction between real pleasure and false pleasure. And the funny thing is, God wants to comfort you even in times of suffering and affliction but he's the only true comforter. What we saw, like even with dopamine, people that are addicts, they take the drug to comfort themselves. Then they get guilty and ashamed that they took the drug, so they go to comfort themselves. What do you think they comfort themselves with? 
more drugs. That, it, that pleasure center is never satisfied. And you may have milder versions of it, but nonetheless, you're looking for comfort in all the wrong places. And God says, I want to show you how to get comfort even in the midst of pain. I told God when I had sciatic pain, do I have to quit the pastorate? This was in my first pastorate. Do I have to quit the pastorate because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I can't think when people are talking to me. The pain is so severe. I don't know what to do, except I'm going to enjoy you forever. And he even told me one time as a baby Christian, the joy of the Lord was so strong after my filling with the Holy Spirit that, that I went to a meeting and all of a sudden the joy lifted and I didn't know what happened. And Ralph Wilkerson from Melody Land came and out of 80 people walked right over to me and says, I got a story to tell you. He said, when I was a young man, the joy left me. I go, oh man, he's reading my mail. And he says, because God wants you to love him more than the joy. Oh, when you love him more, the jo and the joy came back. Because it almost got to the point where you start exalting the feeling of joy more than him. And he wanted me, he said, it's a small step, but you come back. And that joy will never leave you. And it'll be your strength, but it's a person. It's him. So, Father, we just thank you that in the days ahead, God's going to help Jason and I. We're going to work on a joy challenge, but it's a life joy challenge. A life joy challenge because there's too much is missing. I don't hear, I don't hear people saying, look what they have. I don't know what it is, but I want it. Well, I hear it in this little church, but I don't hear it in the church at large. They give us more stuff to do, things to think about. But I'll tell you what, what, what Jason has tapped into, I think prophetically, is he's broken into that arena and saying there's tens of thousands of people who have lies keeping them from the freedom and the love and the joy and the peace that God's got for them. And if you came to this place, you're in the right place. Because we've seen the solution, and I've seen it my entire life with uh, major uh, name leaders. I don't got to name names, drop names, but prayed with them who, with all of their training and all of their theology, many times could not get free from a simple thing that Jason found in himself. And I've seen it over and over again. And I'm telling you what, it's time that this is reproduced. That's our legacy. Our legacy is going to be a ministry of joy. From this day forward, it's going to be a ministry of joy. And it's going to be available to tap into for whosoever. The only ones that won't, of course, will be the ones that have excuses. And, and my joy is fulfilled. Just I understand, John, when on Tuesday night, like Jason said, when I see everybody participating and the unity, there's a, my, there's a joy that I tap into. And I know you, some of you tap into the same thing. And there's actually something very unhealthy in you if you do not feel joy being around other Christians. If there's not a want to, there's something in you that's a major barrier, major, and it can come down. And we got the tools. This will be the good place to get it to come down. You should be excited to be with other Christians. There is a joy. Remember John said, our hands touched him and, and our eyes saw him and we touched him and we saw him and we heard him and make our joy fulfill. You can have this too. The question is, do you want that too? Hmm? Amen? Amen. 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 Amen? Amen. Amen. The joy challenge. Coming up someday. <laughs> Thank so. you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.